Welcome back to your mama's favorite podcast. Why your mama's? I don't know. Because <laughs> I wanted to start differently. And I think lots of moms like our podcast. Oh, are we a mom's podcast? I hope so. Oh. Shout out to all the cool moms out there. All the cool moms. Okay. <laughs> well, I I think that's a compliment. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Oh, very We're, good. We are a podcast for every generation. Yes. Silas has a what eighth grade friend yeah and every day at school he found out that silas's parents have a podcast and so he'll talk to him about it like hey your mom and dad were talking about this and they said this and silas is like why are you listening to my parents podcast and i love it so shout out to matt in eighth grade at paris <laughs> middle school we love you podcast shout outs <laughs> to the middle school very good well uh this week um we are actually going to talk about uh, a title that is actually part of our sermon series and um i think that just what we were talking about is you know sometimes on a sunday it can be one point um and there's not a, there's so many other things that you're saying that you don't you want to kind of go back and talk about that and so that's kind of what we wanted to do uh this this podcast is really yeah. talk about flourishing in Babylon. And I could do seven of these podcasts because I'm actually very passionate about this uh, subject and really trying to do that excellent. And um, of course, um, Los Angeles could be a mini Babylon, but you could be in anywhere in the world and kind of considered a Babylon. Peter writes to the church and he actually says to the church in Babylon, uh, just so it, Babylon is just that uh, expression all throughout the Bible that is when you're in an environment or a culture that opposes the things of God. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all uh, in that, even if you live in the Vatican, there's probably yeah. some, uh, probably some situations, <laughs> probably more, uh, but, uh, and so just getting that. And I think that one of my favorite scriptures and to be quite honest, and maybe everyone else already knew this, but I never knew this until actually studying, uh, and, and preparing for this sermon series, but you know, probably almost most of my life, uh, except for high school when I was graduating, uh, one of my life verses would have been Jeremiah 29 11. So can I tell the funny story on that? It's not, no, you shouldn't or. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. <laughs> you I'll just said it. I can be entertained. Oh, uh, okay. So I graduated from a Christian school. And so everybody always just writes Jeremiah 29 11 as their um, scripture verse. So that, you know, when you graduate, they have that verse or whatever. Boring. Yeah, well, kind of, it's just what everybody did. It's a good did. verse. It's a good it's verse. A we love it. Great Jesus. verse. It's a great verse. And we're talking about it today. It's so just it's overused. a great verse. Everybody always uses it. And uh, and so then I, instead of using the ones that everybody kind of used, I just kind of snuck mine in there. And it was Isaiah 4 4, which actually says, In that day, seven women will grab a hold of one man. <laughs> and they didn't <laughs> catch ridiculous. it. And I was like, Yes. So that's like my equivalent of like when they do crazy things at graduations, you know, backflips or come in without pants or something like that. I did a, a misquote of scripture verse. So anyhow, getting back to Jeremiah 29, 11, what I never realized is Jeremiah chapter 29 is actually a prophetic um, uh, uh, verses chapter written to those in Babylon. And then it says in Daniel that when Daniel was um, about 80, six years old, um, he is, he's, He's praying for his city. He's he's in Babylon. And the Bible says he gets the word from Jeremiah and starts figuring out what God's purpose was and all those kind of things. And I just think that it's so powerful. So anyhow, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you a hope. That was not to, um, in a nice soft bubble of people that were in Jerusalem where everything was going well. So it was actually to those in Babylon, mm. who had been taken captive, who were being, uh, you know, in this environment that opposed the things of God. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you hope. I love that so much. And that's what we really want to talk about today is just flourishing in Babylon. And Israel, you've been doing this series for 
three or four weeks now. Yeah. And every single week at church, if you're part of Flourishing Church, you know, this has been such a powerful series. And so honestly, we could just, I could sit here and just listen to all of the historic stuff that you um, have been speaking on and the, and the real prophetic, this is a prophetic word. And I was just going to say, if it was, you know, we're, it, we're not, this isn't a message to Babylon. This is a message to people living in this season where it feels like, the world is coming against every godly principle and really coming against Christians and um, even our rights in America. It's our rights to exercise biblical living and um, living by God's truth. And it's being ridiculed. There's laws being passed against it. And also just culturally, you can be canceled because you believe the word of God right now. And so this is such an important conversation for us to be having in this season of the world. And, and, you know, I feel like, I don't know, you can kind of speak to this, but I kind of feel like we're in an in-between we're in the tension of, we're not in the midst of this revival. Like there isn't this outpouring of the Holy Spirit so much that government is changing yet. I believe it's coming, but we're also in this season where it's like, so our Christian beliefs are under attack and everything's becoming way more worldly. Even Christians are becoming way more worldly minded than they are um, kingdom minded and, and living by the word of God because of the influence of culture. But we're also not, we're in the in between. We're not yeah. in the middle of revival. And so it's this, what, how do we respond and what is God calling? us how do we flourish how do we build our lives right now in, in a way that honors god when it feels a little bit like we don't know what's coming next yeah i know i agree and i don't think that we even have the full answers to that that's the million dollar question huh on some of that but i do think that the great thing about god is his word is so powerful and, and it does address some of these things. And so we can look at well, one of the stories that we can look at is we can actually look at the book of Daniel or the life of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who really were put into Babylon and kind of like put into, an, an again, an environment that is anti-God. And how did they flourish? How did they get promoted? How did they um, keep Daniel, it says, one of the verses says that, um, and he continued uh, through the rule of Cyrus and uh, and then, you know, the other king of Persia and then Nebuchadnezzar. So he goes through, you know, all of these and he still keeps on being a political leader and ruler. And, uh, and how does he do it? How does he flourish? And so I think that that's the I think that that is the balance of trying to figure that out, Rachel, is we're not uh, what is uh, Wizard of Oz says, we're not Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. So we're not in the um, the the safety of Christian Christendom that it mm -hmm. used to be, where even 1962 Los Angeles Times would have a reading of the Bible, what you were supposed to read during the week. Well, the the LA Times does not post that now. So times have changed and, you know, prayer out of school, like you were saying, all the opposition against Christianity, but how yeah. do we still flourish? And I think there's a couple different ways that people naturally react. Um, I think one of their reactions is build a bunker and mm -hmm. let's hide and let's save canned foods and uh, Armageddon is coming and, uh, you know, kind of that, that Y2K, um, all of that. And uh, it's, so it's, it's bunker down, it's hunker down, it's hide from the big bad world and uh, all of that. So that's one far extreme. I think the other, um, another extreme is like, like physical fight. Come on, we are going to, the kingdom of God is taken and the violent take it by force. Totally misquote. But, uh, you know, then we we feel like we are somehow, we have to physically yeah. fight instead of necessarily spiritually win the war. And so mm -hmm. it is, it's a tough thing. But what I love about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is they weren't defiled. They did not defile their faith, but at the same time, they were 10 times better yeah. than anybody else in Babylon when it came to Babylonian literature and mathematics. And so there's this 
this how do we we're in the world but we're not of the world how do we flourish in babylon and i think that that is a consistent walk with the holy spirit and i think it does take a mentality and i i love i i mean uh, before i read it rach why don't you if there's something that jumps out to you but i do want to read that in jeremiah 29 of what jeremiah's letter said to those mm. in babylon maybe that could even um help us with our articulation, help us with our, what kind of attitude should we have? Yeah. And, and how should we be thinking for that? Yeah, I think that the goal of today is just maybe encouraging fellow believers who really want to get this moment in, his, in history right. And yeah. I think about the scripture that says that the sons of Issachar, they had an understanding of the times. Oh, so and um, I think that that's what we need. We need to have a prophetic understanding of what's going on and not be afraid of the days that we're in. If we were Swifties, we would call it the Babylon era. It's the <laughs> Babylon era. And honestly, in the natural eye, it's pretty disappointing. And maybe like us, it feels like the enemy is winning a few rounds and you're not seeing the victory that you're really believing God to see. And so it can be disheartening and feel like, where am I going wrong? Um, where's God in this? You know, where's the justice? Justice. And I think that um, that is the wrong path. That's not the path God wants us to take. I believe that God wants us to see him moving in the midst of a lot of uh, a lot of things that are showing their face in an evil way. I think that we need to be able to have spiritual eyes and see kind of like uh, Elijah's servant. And he said, God, pray that the blinders will come off of his eyes so that he can see that there are more for us than against us. And it is the angel of army, ar army of angels, you know, that there is a spiritual world and that the, the enemy is losing in that spiritual will world. And we can take comfort in that. And so how, what is, I love this portion of scripture and what you preached on Sunday, because I do believe it's God's answer for us in today. Yeah. I, I loved what you said too. It does really, if you have a prophetic word, I think, um, Paul talks about that's how we fight the fight is, you know, hold on to that prophetic word that was spoken about you earlier. And so when you have that and you know, no, I'm called to flourish. It changes the mindset from being mm -hmm. a victim. Uh, it changes the mindset of, um, you know, rapture mentality. It changes the mindset of being a jerk. <laughs> it changes right. every kind of mindset about that. And then so uh, Jeremiah 29 verse four says, um, this is what uh, Jeremiah's letter said, this is what the Lord of heaven's army, the God of Israel says to all the captives he that have been exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem, build homes, plan to stay, plant gardens, eat the fruit they produce, marry and have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren, multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of this city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Mm. What a powerful, powerful verse. And then, of course, just a few verses down later, it is where God says, come on, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope in a future. And so I love so much of that is, um, no, we're going to build houses. Come on, we're not, we're not shrinking back. We're not building bunkers. No, come on, we're going to plant. We're going to sow. We're going to sow our lives. We're going to sow into the kingdom, and we're going to reap a harvest even in this season. Come on, we're going to have children, right. and we're going to raise those children. We just did a podcast not too long ago about disciplining the children. Come on, we're going to train those children, and we're going to we're going to multiply. They're going to marry other believers. Come on, we're going to, and then they're going to have kids. We're 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 not shrinking back. We are growing, establishing. We are yeah. anti-culture, anti but we are going against the grain yeah. and we are really doing that. And so I love that. I, I love the word don't dwindle is what uh, one translation says. Don't don't shrink back. Come on, build. And then um, you and I have been talking about just back and forth bantering about like our city, loving our city and praying for the city and not 
just closing our eyes or like you just mentioned, putting the blinders on and not seeing things. Come on, God, give us the answers for the city where the church is the answer for Los Angeles. Come on, flourishing church is the answer for our community, not that we just ignore it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm very into reading comments more than anything else on posts. <laughs> and we have this, like, I'm here just for the comments. Oh my goodness. Some of the comments on things. Um, but it's just so entertaining and it really shows you the heart of our culture and society Ooh. too. It's like, wow, people are edgy. There's a little, cr they need to eat a peanut butter sandwich because they're very hangry, Trolls. but um, they are so hangry Israel. Yeah. The, the world is so hungry that they're getting cranky mm. and we know the answer. And so every time that we choose to build a bunker or to have a little bless me club of people who make us feel safe because they are saying the same things, they're boycotting what we're bo boycotting. We really um, are not feeding the need of the hunger. And God has called us to serve a table to the lost and the broken. And we should not be afraid to have sinners at the table. Mm -hmm. And when we are, we are missing the whole point of why did we get saved and God not just take us straight to heaven? Yeah. Because he doesn't just care about us. Yeah, He cares about the lost and he gave us the great commission for days like these. And it's, you know, it would be a lot easier if everyone, it was easy to get people saved, but it's going to take getting dirty. It's going to take crossing over to people that don't think the way we do. Maybe they even hate us because they don't know who our God is yet. And I just think that we have to rise up in, in boldness and, and not allow attitude, judgment from sinners, whatever it might be, to make us afraid. And we need to begin to start purchasing houses. We need to begin to fill them with good things. We need to begin to reproduce and celebrate the goodness of God, even in the middle of darkness. And what a better testimony to be peace carriers of the Holy Spirit and, and being able to say, I am unafraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ but I'm not using it as a giant spanking stick to the world. I'm going to exemplify the difference between living for Jesus, following his ways. And then I love what Jeremiah says right there. He says, work for the welfare of your city yeah. because it is in their welfare that you will have welfare. So when we invest in the lost, when we don't shrink back from helping where we can help and, and lighting up the darkness, it, it, the Bible says that that's where our blessing comes from. How I good know. is that? So good. We can do that. And uh, one of the things that I, you're just bringing up that, and it just reminds me of is when I was studying, but it's amazing to me the, um, the amount of the gospel that was preached in the book of Daniel, um, not from Daniel. Uh, and so you actually see in Nebuchadnezzar's case, and you also see in the case of uh, when the Persians came in and Daniel, uh, you know, is thrown into the lion's den and he comes out two different times uh, in this and actually a third with Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. But Nebuchadnezzar writes a decree. <laughs> to the world. He was at that time uh, the leader of the world at that time. He had conquered everywhere and he sends out a decree about how the God of Daniel, how the God uh, of the Hebrews was the true God. And so it's amazing. So like on point, everybody gets this uh, thing. And then the same thing happens uh, with, I believe it's Darius. Um, and he actually said, makes a, a decree in the in the laws of the Medes and the Persians, makes it part of the law that the God of Daniel is the most high God. And it's so it's amazing because all these young men did, so they decided to not be defiled. They really had faith and lived it, not just talked about it. Come on, there's a difference between just like you were saying, keyboard ninjas, letting comments. I'm talking about death, life, I'll choose if it means death over compromise and it actually resulted in the case of revival in a mm. sense in the nations the gospel being promoted um from babylon so it's it is it is a tough season but it's actually where your gods don't work and our god does and so it's it really is the time to flourish in that 
I love that. And Daniel could have been like, you know, when they were all bowing down and he didn't bow down to the idol, you know, it doesn't say that Daniel told them all off. It doesn't say that Daniel even cursed the false gods. It says that Daniel stood for what he knew. And in that That was enough. And I think that there's this pressure for Christians to rebuke everyone that's not doing it right. And so you make the world feel as little and as horrible as possible. You become so self-righteous in your own righteousness, you know, that kind of thing. And Daniel really is a good example to us of he never, he never used his faith or his strength to attack anyone else. He used his faith and strength to stay strong. No, it's so good. And then God was glorified and then did the heavy lifting of changing hearts. Yeah, it's so true because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the the terminology that they use to Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar is furious, Daniel is probably out on an assignment somewhere else as an emissary, but the Mm -hmm. three say, we're not going to bow. But even the way they say it to him, honorable king, uh, even if we could, we won't. Yeah, that's and, so good. And even if God doesn't show up, we're <laughs> still faithful to him. You know what I mean? It was just the way that they use the language is such a, wow, we should reread that. And then Daniel, in the very beginning, when he is addressed with um, the conversation with the chief eunuch, hey, um, you know, and the eunuch says, no, that'll kill me. Could we try this? Could we be tested in this? Just the honor that Daniel spoke to somebody from a different country, from a different culture, from a different anti-God, and then won him over, we should all get a hold of that. And then even at the end, when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den, just this unwavering, oh, that's the rule? Okay, I'm going to go back, opened his windows to Jerusalem. So it's not, we're not selling a passive Christianity. We're not trying to somehow, some water down, nope, open up the window. (laughs) I'm praying towards Jerusalem. I'm praying towards my God. And it's the only fault that they could figure out how are we going to trap Daniel? There's nothing. Can't trap him with the way he does with his money. Can't um, trap him in relationships. Can't trap him in any of this. The only thing that we can trap him in is his uh, love for God. And that's the only thing that he could found. So I really like what you just said. It's like, oh my goodness, our test, now's the time. People are looking. Yeah. People are looking. And we have a couple people that we've been really just befriending, loving, praying for, being the light without correcting their sin. And it's, what are we, 10 years in? And just now they're starting to ask us about the Bible. Just now I bought my friend who doesn't know Jesus a Bible, and I'm just teaching her how to have a relationship through the word of God and really seek him for herself. And it took 10 years. Daniel was such a good example of faith in God with not instant results and not being afraid of that. And and just, I think, knowing that, um, you know, like Paul says, that I, I might plant the seed, Apollos waters, it, but it's God who brings the in, increase. And um, it is, I guess maybe I just want to encourage you, it's not on you to see the change, but it is on you to be righteous and to trust God to do the to move the heart of man and even to move the heart of government. And and as we pray, as we stand, as we don't, we don't waver, that's how you flourish in Babylon. And I just want to read this scripture. I love that portion of uh Jeremiah that you read. And this is another um portion of Jeremiah that I have um pulled up, but it's Jeremiah 32. And I don't even, you can read it because it's the most beautiful portion of scripture, but it's when Jeremiah is thrown into prison, the Babylonians Mm -hmm. had just taken over um, and his whole entire city, all the people he loves is under siege and he's put into prison and in prison, God commands him to buy property. And it's because God is telling him, I'm not finished. It's that same, yeah. for I know the plans I have for you. They're good plans. They're plans to prosper you. You do have a hope and a future. And he, God asked Jeremiah to purchase land from prison. Wow. And I think that that's a really big key to flourishing in Babylon is to keep dreaming, to keep asking God what the future holds, yeah. to keep making decisions. So and, good, and I believe maybe a little bit prophetically too, is that it is going to be while there is the opposition, while the world feels like our financial world is crumbling and, you know, all of these horrible things are happening. 
to the natural eye. I believe that in it, if we can stick close to the Lord and listen to his voice and not stop dreaming and building and doing, I believe that God's people are going to begin to walk into supernatural blessing. Yeah. And, and, and as the world begins to crumble, God's people will begin to arise, not because we're better, but because we're living by the principles of the Lord. And there's a big difference. There's fruit in that. Oh, and that, I mean, right there, I think people are fruit inspectors. They're looking for that. And so um, I love the text that maybe ties into that for me, at least, is where they, when they, the king examined Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, it says that they found them 10 times better. And really, that's what should happen in Babylon. When we're in Babylon, we should be 10 times better. Our marriages should be better. Our anxiety, fear should be better. Our countenance should be better. Our joy should be 10 times better. Come on. Our sales, if you're in sales, should be 10 times better. Our companies that we're trying to do, come on. Amen. Everything that we do, um, reflect because of the God inside of us only exemplifies in Babylon. It doesn't shrink back. It doesn't. It actually in Babylon is where we shine the greatest. We shot. We, we, this is our moment. I love what Peter says. Uh, and I've just tried to like really soak on this is he's the church in Babylon, which would really grab my attention to the elect, which is like, there's this like, this is your seat, your elect. You've been chosen for mm. this time. As uh, Mordecai says it to Esther, for such a time as this. Amen. And so he knew, he knew he's uh, the Holy Spirit, God and Jesus aren't biting their nails in heaven, freaking out at 2024, what's happening in America. Um, they um, knew before you were even formed in your mother's womb, uh, the plan, Jeremiah also declares that, is that uh, he knew where we were going to live, what era we were going to live, mm -hmm. and really knew this is their season. This yeah. is the time they are going to shine. And we really do. Lightness is always the brightest out of the dark. Yeah. You know, you don't really see a flashlight on when it is midday. You can't really tell. Uh, like if your phone uh, flashlight is on, you don't really know during the day that it's on because everything is light. But mm. at night when it's dark, you know when that thing is on because it's uh, making it. And so if we are in a Babylonian era, we're only going to shine brighter. Yeah. And our prayer for you is that God would open up and unlock the secrets of heaven, that God's people will walk in divine wisdom and answers that the world just doesn't have. And yeah. that's what God wants to use us for is to being the hope to this world and to live differently and to have that. I, I, the last thing I would just say too, is how important community is. Yeah. I, um, there have been moments where I have felt like I wanted to dwindle. I wanted to shrink back in fear. And because of my relationship with Israel, you as my husband, just you going, that's not what God's called us to start thinking like or acting like and making the wrong decisions out of fear or being tired and also friendships and also the church just being yeah. planted, you know, planted in the house of the Lord, the righteous flourish. They will bear fruit in every season and they will stay green and fresh even in old age. And that's God's plan for us as we walk through a season that feels like Babylon is the blessing, favor, delight of the Lord. I love that. And it really does show Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, you know what I mean? That just, it wasn't just a story of Daniel, but it shows the importance of community. And, you know, I'm sure there were times they strengthened each other. I'm sure that there were times that it was difficult when, mm -hmm. and the temptation to just like, it's just food, you know, offered to idols. We don't believe in idols. So we shouldn't, we just do, you know what I mean? But like, no, come on, let's go for it. Let's pray for each other. Supernatural strength. You know, I'm strong struggling with this, man, we get you. And so we're praying for you and let's flourish. Let's, you know what scripture I like about all that, uh, Rach, is it says, let's have grandchildren. So Phoebe and Chloe, get, get married. Well, get married, then get okay. busy and have oh my some gosh. kids. Someday we're going to have the cutest grandbabies. Oh, I know it. my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait. Well, Meeting. I can wait because I'm just, are we too, are we old enough to be grandparents? I'm ready. Wow. Why not? 
Wow, 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 wow. Okay, uh, email us your comments. Let us know, are we or are we not old enough for grandkids? And I uh, hope you enjoy <laughs> Campbell Soup Broadcast. 